we're really lucky today because we have not one, but we have four Ruby core committers here today. And you're going to hear from uh, many of them individually over the next couple of days, but we wanted to take this opportunity to bring them all together up on the stage and get a sense of where Ruby is moving as a whole. So it's my very, very big pleasure to uh, invite them up onto the stage. Uh, can I please invite the one and only Matt? Let's give him a huge round. And of course, uh, Hiroshi Shibata. Woo! Who will be speaking to you tomorrow. And the one and only Aaron Patterson with his selfie stick. <laughs> And last but not least, Aman Gupta, who's uh, very graciously joined us today as well. Uh, please have a seat, gentlemen. Um, and joining me for this panel is Winston, the man who brought you this conference. So Matt's, of course, needs no introduction. Um, I'm sure uh, you guys all know uh, who he is. He's the reason we're here today. Um, uh, Shubhata-san, next to him, uh, is a CRuby committer. And he's going to be speaking to us about MRuby tomorrow. Um, Aaron is a core contributor to both Ruby and Rails. Uh, he's a 2010 Ruby hero, and he's giving the closing keynote tomorrow. And Aman, next to me, is a 2009 Ruby hero, and uh, he's been working on making Ruby leaner, meaner, and faster for you. So how this is going to work is we're going to start with a couple of questions for our esteemed panelists, and then uh, we will uh, give it over to you guys uh, if you have any questions for them. Okay, so uh, maybe what we can do is while we start with the first few questions, if you have a question for our panel, if you can line up behind the microphones, uh, then we'll know uh, to uh, give you your turn at the end of the question. Okay? Yes. So thank you, everyone. Um, shall we begin? Sure. <clears throat> Um, so to give a little bit of background of why we are doing this panel this year, um, I was sort of inspired when I went over to Ruby Kaigi uh, last year, and I saw uh, this Ruby computers on stage, and it was overwhelming because on stage they had like, I don't know, 50 people maybe. <laughs> <laughs> around, around that, I, I don't know, it was like the stage was full of Ruby commuters. So I'm like, oh, can we do something like this in Singapore? <laughs> uh, but it's difficult to, you know, to get 50 Ruby commuters in Singapore, honestly. Um, so, you know, I'm really honored that we have uh, <laughs> them here today, and that's why I thought we shouldn't miss this opportunity, especially uh, to interview them uh, about the future of Ruby and what they think about Ruby, etc. And I hope that you all will find this chance uh, really awesome as well, uh, because it's a chance for you to voice out any opinions, feedback that you have about Ruby as well uh, to our panelists. Great. Right. Um, so maybe we can begin with something uh, a little more simple. And this is a question for all of you. Uh, what are you working on right now? What was the last thing you worked on before you came here? Me, me? <laughs> Let's start with you, Matt. Okay. It, I spent my, my time uh, designing Ruby, so the making decision about the language feature, like, a, like a accepting proposal, accepting and rejecting proposals, and uh, had a, the, the future, write a future the, Roadmap. And then at the same time, I'm working on the, as a programmer on MRuby and the stream languages. It's already on. Okay. So I maintain so a uh, lot of many uh, lot of uh, websites or like uh, RubyLang.org and RubyCI.com and uh, Bragg's RubyLang.org uh, as an issue tracker. So I operate. I I'm an infrastructure uh, engineer of uh, RubyLang, and uh, I'm maintainer of uh, C Ruby and uh, Rdoc and Rake and uh, Ruby James and Ruby Build. So I support to uh, build. Uh, build issue and uh, uh, synchronizing code uh, upstream and uh, Ruby trunk. Hello? Is it on? No. 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 Okay. Uh, maybe you can use one of the other mics. All right. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. I work on a few of the 
I maintain a couple of the libraries in the standard library like um, Fiddle and Psych, and recently I've been working on, uh, I mean mainly I look at how Ruby works from a Rails perspective, so I'm on both the Rails and the Ruby core team, so basically I look at how our application runs and performs, or our Rails application runs and performs, and then I think about improvements that we could do to Ruby to deal with that. And recently I've been looking at code loading, which I'm gonna talk a lot about during my talk, so I don't wanna say too much more. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, I work mostly on performance, so whenever there's, we run, uh, I work at GitHub, so we have a pretty large Rails application. And uh, we have a lot of extraneous Ruby code as well, so we try to optimize as much as possible on the Rails side, but there's times that we need to jump down to Ruby and, and make improvements there. Uh, I am most interested at the moment in boot time, uh, sort of similar to the work that Aaron's been doing, but uh, I'm working on a couple of patches that are still very experimental, but trying to get uh, boot time as fast as possible for our app. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so. Just now in the, in the earlier keynote, we have already heard about Mets talking about, you know, there are other languages out there right now, like Go, Elixir, Rust, etc., that probably, you know, has some good features uh, that we should adopt uh, for probably Ruby 3.0. But Ruby 3.0 is probably going to be a little bit away from now. Um, more of looking at the whole community in general, are you worried that people are moving away from Ruby to, to go into other languages? And this is a question for all of you as well, so feel free to jump in. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, it, it's, the, it's up to the, the, each individual's decision, so we cannot say anything. But uh, so at least, you know, we often say the open source community is kind of like a shark. So if we stop swimming, we would die. <laughs> so the, we have to indicate we are to, to the community or to the world, we are alive, and we are improving, we are moving forward. So the, that's the things I am thinking of always. It's, it's in my opinion, it's hard not to get worried about stuff like that. I think maybe because I spend way too much time reading Hacker News. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously though, because you read it and they're like, oh, it's, one day it's JavaScript, the next day it's Rust, the next day it's, you know, whatever. So you always think about that, but then I remember like, well, I'm actually building real applications, not, you know, some blog. <laughs> so. It's it's difficult to say it's difficult to say for sure. I I think probably sorry Matt. I think probably Ruby's not cool anymore. <laughs> I mean I love I love it. I love programming in Ruby. It's just I'm maybe I'm not very cool. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do you guys think Ruby is cool? Yeah. <laughs> A little more enthusiasm, yeah. please come on. It's not it's not cool for hacker news. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I agree. You know, the, maybe ten years ago when Rails came into the world, so the, the everyone is new to Ruby, basically, and it it, it a, appears very cool and new nifty things. But it, you know, these days, you know, we have Ruby for a long time, so Ruby hasn't changed drastically for a long time. So you know, but uh, but it's how we are money. <laughs> okay. Great. Anything from yeah. I would, I would say that competition is definitely a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm not worried because it's cool to see all these new ways of approaching programming and we can learn a lot from them. And at the end of the day, you know, like when you're trying to get something done, there's advantages to using one thing over another. So for instance, I maintain the event machine jam and mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, like, uh, Ruby developers that tried to do vented programming in event machine had a really hard time because it was a very different way of thinking about stuff. And it was very easy for those developers to use a blocking library or use a gem off the shelf and then try to fit that into event machine. And those two paradigms didn't work as well. And so for me, it was actually nice to see people start to use Go or, or Node.js or other technologies for those applications because they were better suited towards getting those types of things done. And that doesn't mean that Ruby is not as good or, 
or any less because, you know, like for me, I write a lot of C, I do a little bit of Go, uh, but at the end of the day, I still think in Ruby, and there's certain class of applications where Ruby is my go-to, whereas there's other sorts of applications where if I am very performance sensitive or I am thinking about getting something done in two megs of RAM, then maybe Ruby is not the right solution there, and I can experiment with these other things, learn concepts there, and then bring those back to Ruby to improve Ruby in the long term. That's great. Um, this is a question uh, for Matt, uh, since um, we're going to do one for each of you, and then we're going to jump back to the audience and see what you guys have for us. Um, have you ever thought about creating another new language from scratch? So you talked a little bit about that this uh, morning. Yeah. <laughs> we, I, I just created the, the stream programming language last December. So that, it, it was, you know, this is, it was just experiment. I, 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 have no, I had no intention to, to make it public, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, workplace, I, I put my source code into the GitHub, so the someone found, found the, the repository, and then, <laughs> then he passed it to the hacker news. <laughs> <laughs> so it became cool again. <laughs> yeah, and then, at that time, it was the 200 lines of code, you know, it's just, it, just, it was just a toy. Mm -hmm. and then, with the, you know, the, the huge thread in the hack news or the, the Reddit, and the, everyone gave a star on it in the toy <laughs> program. program. And the, I had a 3,000 star, GitHub stars, and oh. 200 lines of code. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was funny. And then, I thought open source was that, you know, the, the gathered community around the, some kind of the workable, uh, working code. But, uh, no, the stream pr proved it was wrong. <laughs> you know, it was just, it's quite easy to be popular <laughs> if the hacker news found it. <laughs> <laughs> um, to follow up, um, would you have done anything differently looking back now that you know um, everything that you know about uh, how Ruby has progressed and now starting this new thing from scratch? You know, as, as, as I mentioned in keynote that 1993 was a totally different situation mm -hmm. and then we had the single we had single core machine we had this very simple programs mm -hmm. but if I saw the 2015 back then so I would I would do differently for concurrency mm -hmm. and then I would do different from the I, I, I would have less inherited from uh, pro as a scripting features, you know the, you know the importance of the scripting feature is uh, getting less and less important. Do you think that M Ruby is sort of something, you know, that would solve some of the problems? Uh, some of them, yes. Uh, the M Ruby is uh, uh, conforming to the ISO standard we defined in 90, uh, 2012, and. Uh, that it lacks the definition of the some kind of the dollar special variables or the, the something like that. So the and even uh, regular expression is uh, optional. So in that sense, uh, MRuby is much simpler and smaller. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, this is a question for Shibata-san. Um, you're using Ruby from a very practical angle. Um, what do you think is the most important benefit that Ruby gives you? Sorry. Uh, sorry. <coughs> <laughs> so maybe the question would be, why are you still using Ruby? <laughs> yeah, I will be an interpreter. <laughs> I think uh, Ruby Lang is the, uh, so I feel uh, I, I write uh, Ruby code, so I feel uh, fun. So it's, um, uh, I think, the most important thing for uh, Ruby. So So he feels he's coding when he codes in Ruby. You know? Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that means if you're working in other languages, you're probably working rather than. 
coding. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the, sometimes we feel the, uh, we as we are doing some kind of the bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I feel uh, I feel uh, I wrote uh, other languages, uh, some languages. So <laughs> I feel uh, I'm working. Mm -hmm. That uh, I write a little bit. Uh, I'm programming. Right. So I feel. So I guess, I guess a lot of us probably share the same sentiments exactly, which is why we are all still here. <laughs> right? Some from even the first ever Red Dot Ruby Conf, because we all felt that you know, using Ruby is really productive, really fun, uh, which is why we continue to do it, uh, even though there might be you know, other languages out there as well. Yep. Um, this question is for Aaron. Um, a lot of people depend on uh, the improvements that you make to the code and the work that you do every day. Um, and people closely follow um, what you're doing and what all of you are doing to a certain extent. How do you decide what you're working on next? <laughs> oh dear. Tough questions. <laughs> well, so usually, I mean, basically the way that it works is uh, I take the specific features that I want to do, uh, and then I have a system of levers and coins that I flip. <laughs> and... <laughs> no, no. Uh, basically, the stuff that I choose to work on is driven by, well, it'll either be, uh, there's a few different things that drives me. First off, it'll be, things that we need for our application. So that'll be, that's one of the things that I'll work on. Uh, other times it'll just be like somebody files a bug and it's like, oh, this is a pretty bad bug. Or like, we should probably fix that. So that's, that'll be something that I work on. And then the, probably the third category is where I just get, I get distracted and I'm like, oh, this is such an interesting problem and I just dive in and spend probably too much time on that, on that particular thing. So it's, it's typically one of those three things, um, but yeah, it, I think most of the time it's driven by the applications that we use at work. Mm. So that's, that's where I put most of the weight. Um, <clears throat> so one last question for Aman. Uh, so you have done a lot of work on performance, tuning, and you know, debugging for, for Ruby. What has been your biggest challenge so far uh, when you were doing this performance-related work? That's interesting. Um, the one that comes to mind right away is not even, it's a little bit technical, but I think, so there was a point of like about three to four months before the 2.1 release, where I was working very closely with Koichi-san, and uh, we, it was a really good collaboration, but it was challenging in one, in terms of time zones, because I found myself basically waiting the entire day for 5 p.m. my time, because I was like, okay, Koichi sounds gonna wake up and I have like 10 <laughs> questions for him. <laughs> and so that was interesting. And then also like the language barrier was definitely a big part of it. And uh, we, so we, we collaborated on the garbage collector for a long time and uh, a lot of the first couple of months was really talking about variable names and doing renamings and refactorings and cleaning up the code so that it was much more easy to understand. And a lot of it was like, you know, he would uh, ask me questions about like, what is the subtle difference between this word and this word in the English language and try to get like the exact right <laughs> naming. But uh, it, it felt kind of cumbersome for, for a while, but I think it ended up in a really good place where a lot of the commits during that time were like search and replace, you know, like one word to another word. And, but the end result was after a few weeks of that, the code was much easier to read, much easier to understand. You could look at a function name and really get a sense of, okay, this is what it's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that was the most challenging in terms of even understanding a lot of the code and understanding why it was written in that way and then getting to a point where we could simplify it. I think it ended up in a spot where now it's much easier for anybody who has a basic understanding of C to be able to go in and read that code, even though it is, you know, gt.c is one of the largest, most complicated files mm -hmm. in the VM right now. Yeah. That's great. Um, and uh, to round off, back to Matt's for one more question for you. Um, in a previous interview, you mentioned that uh, for the first few years, you wrote Ruby largely on your own, and then people start, started to, to join and contribute. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this first community formed? Uh, the, right after the, I, I put 
Right after I put the, the Ruby on the internet on uh, December 95, so the, I formed the, the mailing list, and then I didn't expect many people to, to have interest in, in, in the new pro unknown programming language, but uh, unexpectedly, the, more than 200 people have joined the mailing list. And the, the, first, the first mail in the mailing list is from my friend, so the congratulations to, be, to open your software. Then the second one is the, okay, I found a bug. <laughs> 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 the third one was for me, and okay, I'm sorry I fixed that bug. And the fourth one, I found another bug. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I realized that it's kind of difficult to, to implement a programming language, which is, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, most applications is, has intention, so the, the purpose, but a programming language can do anything. So the, it's quite difficult to, to predict the combination of the features. So the, you know, the, and then back then, I, I, I really didn't have any test of the language. <laughs> <laughs> so the, and then in that sense, you know, Ruby is, is kind of working, but it uh, has a lot of bugs. So it's easier to find, easier to fix. So the people, uh, helping me to fix the bug. Okay, I found the bug, and the, this is the patch to fix that. So in that kind, the involvement to, mm. is, can, uh, could become a core of the, the core, uh, core development team now. So the, we just, in that sense, that Ruby had uh, many smart developers involved in, so then from the, gradually from the community of the developers and users, then their popularity was formed. And then Dave Thomas found the Ruby, then wrote a book, and then DHH found Ruby, and then uh, wrote the, a, Rails, a Ruby on Rails mm -hmm. uh, framework. So the rest is the history. Awesome, and now we're here today. Yeah, so it seems like if you want to have form a community, you should release buggy software first, <laughs> which people can help fix. No, I'm kidding. Actually, I got one question. Um, because we are all doing open source, um, have you ever felt discouraged when you're doing open source? You know, ever thought of, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't, you know, like people are not appreciative of me, etc. Have you ever felt like this and almost wanted to give up? Well, 15. 15 years ago, the, the term open source was invented in 1998, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, as, soon after that, I had a lot of things, the misunderstanding of open source or free software, mm -hmm. free as in free beer, mm -hmm. or, the, you know, or they didn't trust of any open source, so that they consider open source as a toy software or something like that. It's, it's kind of, you know, discouraging for me, but not that big to, to stop the project. But, uh, you know, I, I was, back then I was tired to uh, explain about the benefit of open source and uh, the trustworthiness of the open source software or something like that. But, uh, you know, the situation has changed a lot in the last 15 years. Mm. What about the rest? Mm. Do you have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> I can give you an earful, I suppose. <laughs> Ask me tomorrow night after a few beers, and I will tell you. I will really tell you. No, the worst. Honestly, the worst for me is like. Uh, so uh, maybe you saw Andre's talk this morning about security issues. For me, that's the most. I think that's probably the most discouraging thing, um, especially because like, well. It's hard, it's, hard, it's hard because somebody comes to you and says, like, okay, I've got a bug, and you have to keep it secret. Uh, and <laughs> by the way, uh, I'm going to tell the world about the bug in, on a certain date. Uh, so now you need to make sure to fix it by that date, or everybody's going to know that it's broken. Uh, and then since you have to do it in secret, or since you have to fix it in secret, it's harder to get people to review it, so it's possible that you, the thing that you release is actually broken, which this has absolutely happened to me. Uh, <laughs> and then you also have the potential of 
breaking people's software with the security release. So maybe you, do, you fix the bug, you release it, and then all of a sudden you get people reporting and saying, well, you actually ruined our application. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this happened to me with a high-profile company who is sitting to my right. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean that that sort of stuff is that sort of stuff is really discouraging, and especially you'll get a lot of people who say like, oh, I, how did you, how could you have written that bug? How could that bug exist? When it's just like I don't know. I mean, it just does. So, but I think so. That's in my opinion, that's very discouraging. But you just have to remember, like, well, you know, we wrote the software. It's been there for how who knows how long, and. I mean, it's not my fault that it's, it existed. It's your fault for not noticing. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's basically just the way I have to think about it. But, yeah. I think after this question, we're going to throw things back to you guys. So if you have a question for our panelists, uh, please head up to the mics right now so that we can uh, go right straight to you afterwards. So come on. Um, this is a question for all of you as well. Um, the Ruby community is really nice because, well, Matt's is very nice, and so we are all very nice. I, I, I don't agree. Who's <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Well, if that's the case, that leads me to my question. So what are some common sources of disagreements uh, between you guys uh, among the contributors within the community, and how do you solve them? So I try to consider the the everyone is among uh, the same team. Like uh, you know, sometimes the the people complain about the Ruby or the the, the reporting the bug with with very angry feeling. But uh, I, I consider them to be a a member of a team, like uh, the team of the bay, the broader Ruby community. So. The, by thinking like that, so I don't have to react with the angriness. So I, I don't have to reflect their feeling. So, okay, okay, I'm sorry, but uh, you can so solve the problem, solve the issue together. So in that sense, so we can, we, we at least try to be nice. <laughs> Do you think they're adding emojis? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Emoji is great invention. Okay. And I, in the GitHub, in GitHub issues, we have a lot of sushi <laughs> as a reward. Okay. <laughs> Got it. So that makes me wonder when are so when are we going to add macros? <laughs> <laughs> Laurent, where are you? Uh, never. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, so maybe we can go to the questions. Um, if you could let us know who the question is addressed to and um, what your name is. Uh, this can be for anybody. My name is Casey. Uh, Ruby, I've found, has been a fantastic language for people that are brand new to programming because it takes away a lot of the boilerplate, a lot of the uh, extra syntax, and just lets you start thinking and typing. But part of that simplicity um, can make it difficult for people that are brand new to programming as well because as soon as you get past that surface layer and you actually try to be a core committer or be a committer to uh, some gem and not just a consumer of these products, the complexity gets pretty deep pretty quick. Um, and it's been hard for me as a mentor to get people from that first step to the second step of going back and contributing again. Uh, what advice do you have for me as the mentor and for the people that I mentor in each that uh, to, to get past that first step of now you've learned how to code but maybe Ruby is your first language and it made things easier for you. How do you get to the next part? <laughs> you know, I have never been a beginner, at least in Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right, the, the, we, in programming, so we often see the very deep complexity, uh, often. That, but uh, I think it reflects the fact the world itself is complex. So the, the problem we are going to solve is complex. So the, we have to face it. 
So, but uh, you know, the, we have the power of abstraction. So the the most of the cases uh, that we can abstract away the uh, the complexity of the world and the issues. But uh, when we first solve those question, uh, issues, and we have to struggle with the, that complexity, and, uh, then and, uh, the only strategy we can take is a divide and conquer. So divide the complexity into the small pieces and then abstract away to, to, to the inside detail into the, say, class or library or framework. The, I think that is the only way. So we have to step forward bit by bit. So then uh, we have to face the complexity of the world. I'm, I'm not sure I answered the question or not. I'll, I'll try. All right. So the question was about getting new Ruby developers to contribute to open source stuff, essentially. Uh, we So on the Rails team, we kind of have to deal with that. Um, we get a lot of students every year or so. Well, I think we have them all year, honestly. But we get a lot of students who are there. Uh, some of them are new to programming. Many of them are not new to programming, but they're new to Ruby. And we have to get them working, working on Rails source code itself. Um, one of the biggest challenges for that is you can't ask them to just go look through the bugs. That's impossible with a project like Rails, because it's, it's so big or it's so popular that any bugs that are left over, I guarantee are hard. The reason they are still in the tracker is because they are hard. So um, it's difficult. You can't just point the students straight at that. So typically what we do is we come up with particular projects that we want, we, features we want them to add uh, that we know that they can, like, basically tailored for their particular skill level. So if they're super, like, if they're really, really beginner, maybe we'll have them start refactoring tests or something like that. Just something that's very, you know, it's still contributing, but not, not too deeply, right? Not deep into the APIs. Uh, and then if they're more advanced, we'll put them, you know, put them further down. But some of the things we'll do is like, since they're new projects, it'll be a little bit more, well, I don't want to say greenfield, but less brown. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we have to make sure that we don't ever put those projects in the bug tracker. <laughs> but that's, that's typically our, the, our process for onboarding new, new people with development on Rails. What about for GitHub? I'm sure you have a lot of new developers as well with a very old code base. Uh, yeah, that's definitely, it's tricky. I mean, in terms of advice, I would say, the biggest advice I would give is don't give up, right? Like, even to you as a mentor and to the people that are trying to get caught up. It's, it's not like I started in programming and I was great all of a sudden. I, it took me a really long time to learn the basics and put all the building blocks together to a point now where I can jump into the VM and understand what's going on. And it just, it takes a lot of practice. And so, um, you know, like I really like what Matt said about divide and conquer. I think that's really the only way to approach it is to find those small pieces, find those smaller projects and uh, to start to put those building blocks together and, such that you can actually even approach. Because that's what it is when you're going after a large project like that. That's that mindset that you have to go into it with is understanding, okay, like how do I break this up into maybe five tests or five different libraries or five different smaller pieces and then try to tackle them one by one. Because if you try to go at it all together and even try to fit the whole problem in your head, it, it's just impossible. There's too much to it to try to understand. And, grapple with. Thank you so much. Um, can we have the next question? Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Peter, and uh, my question is for, uh, for Mats. So uh, considering all the progress that has happened on JRuby and Rubinius, is there a future for MRI? And if so, what is that future? <laughs> if, if, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the, Uh, at least the MRI or CRuby will remain as a reference implementation. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the, you know, the original CRuby is optimized for the, the scripting, so that uh, for the, the memory footprint and then the startup time is much 
smaller than, the, say, JRuby. If so the, I don't think we use the JRuby for the tiny text script, text processing, but uh, the Siri also serves that purpose. And then, you know, the new idea is come from uh, the Siri always, just because, you know, I, I'm a C programmer, and uh, my, my core team is C programmer. So the, so the Siri will remain the breathing edge implementation of a Ruby language. Thank you. We have a question on this side. Right, hi, I'm, I'm Joel. I'd um, like to pose this question to the entire team. Um, so when, in the design of the Ruby language, say someone comes up with a new, say, language feature that would bring the language forward, but at the same time could potentially break backwards compatibility, what would be, or how, how, would, we, how, how would the team um, tackle such a proposal? The, right now, we are basically rejecting any back, uh, backward incompatible changes, just because you know, the, we have the millions of Ruby users, including us here <laughs> in, in the auditorium, and it, you know, the, the, we have the tens of millions of lines of Ruby code, so we cannot break them. So the, we cannot introduce any the huge backward incompatible change, uh, the huge backward incompatible change, except for the big reason. So maybe, uh, maybe we, we, I will make some kind of decision to make a huge backward incompatible change, but uh, in that sense, we will see the situation like a Python 3 and a Python 2, or even Power 5 and Power 6. So, that's the situation I am not pleased to see. <laughs> so probably I'm, I'm not going to make that kind of decision. All right, thank you very much. We have one more question here and then one on this side. Uh, this question is for the panel. Um, with all the different versions of Ruby out there, MRI, JRuby, Rubinius, um, are there any plans to, loudly. are there any plans to uh, formalize the, some of the properties of the Ruby language in, in some kind of formal oh my specification? Life. Yeah, so as a standard the jewel, we have the ISO, which is uh, the, it is kind of subset of the Ruby language though. And then we are working on the, the updating the, the ISO spec, uh, 30127 3, or something like that. And then, then uh, that is the, the, the spec, you know, the, the spec come from ISO, it's the nothing but spec. <laughs> and then the, the standard de facto, we are working on the Ruby spec. So the we require team uh, in the, in, uh, received the, the administration of the Ruby spec and we are updating it as a uh, standard the executable spec. So, and then yes, we still have some problems in the, the corner cases in the respect, but we are working on it. I, ho I hope that there is never a formali formalized spec because one of the things I really enjoy about Ruby programming language, the Ruby programming language is it seems, or the culture is it seems like a very hacker centric culture, like it's, it's a programming language for hackers by hackers and I'm afraid that introducing some sort of formal, like this is how you do it thing would ruin that feeling. So. Agreed. <laughs> so the, the IS only defined the core, so not, not the corner cases. And it, it also allows the en enhancements for each implementation. Thank you. Hi, so maybe this time question for committers except for Matt. Imagine <laughs> that you live in a perfect world where you don't have to care about backwards compatibility. What Ruby features would you remove from the language? Uh, two, thing, two things I'm thinking now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the population variables, like a dollar or something. And uh, the second one is threat. 
What about the rest of you? The others? I, li I like threads. <laughs> <laughs> I would add, so if there was something I could add, well, I would remove the dollar variables for sure. What else? Oh, I don't know. But what I would add is um, a good way to do immutable, shareable data structures so that you could share among threads and not break stuff, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's a lot of features that I don't use, which maybe removing would make the language simpler and the implementation simpler. There's like uh, the go-to equivalent, the catch and throw stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, there's uh, <laughs> coroutines or something, right? There's fibers. fibers. There's fibers, but there's also the legacy. Uh, close CC. That's yeah, the close CC. Yeah. yeah. Is that gone now? Maybe. That's not in two. That's not in two. It's or still it's live, but you have to uh, the require the continuation. Oh. Yeah, yeah, continuation. Yeah, so continuation. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to remove that. Flip-flop operator? Flip-flop operator? Big problem. Yeah. I like the flip-flop yeah. operator. I don't know why people hate that operator so much. I like that operator. <laughs> so I just, sorry, I didn't have a mic. I was saying that I like the flip-flop operator. There's a lot of people that hate the flip-flop operator, but I like it. And I don't know why people hate it so much. That, if you don't know what it is, it's the two, dot, two dots and you have a conditional on either side of that. Maybe it's three dots, but you just you do that two dots and you flip, mm -hmm. it flips back and forth. And I like that operator a lot and I don't know why people hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, don't remove that. <laughs> <laughs> Some implementers doesn't have the flip top. For example, and when we don't have. What about you, Shibata-san? Is there anything you'd like to remove? Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, different topics. So, I hope to uh, minimize uh, standard library. So, and replace uh, obsolete library to uh, newer and modern library. To uh, example for uh, net HTTP to uh, Faraday. So, but uh, it's a uh, big incompatible changes. So, I <laughs> he's traveling. Yeah, he's <laughs> trying to solve the, those problems. So we introduced, uh, in Ruby 2, man, 2, 2 0, we introduced a bundle gem so that you can download it as a standard distribution, but uh, it's, it's, a build. it's implemented by gem. So you can replace by gem update. So we are making some old uh, libraries like uh, net telnet, net uh, HTTP. To the into gem and then making it the bundle of gems. So gradually we can remove it from the standard distribution since they are old in the implementation wise and in the spec wise. Do we have more questions from the floor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 I love this reaction. <laughs> I have a question from Matt about. Uh, about uh, typing in Ruby 3.0. Mm -hmm. uh, so you say that uh, adding uh, type annotations in Ruby feels uh, redundant because it's not required. Uh, but in, uh, in Common Lisp, uh, uh, Common Lisp, uh, Common Lisp has, has type annotations, but they are used, uh, as you know, in the object system to, um, to specialize uh, methods in uh, generic functions. And so they are there, but they are used, and then they can be used for uh, type checking or compiler optimizations. So I was wondering if you thought about that for maybe a future version of Ruby about uh, introducing something like that, like generic functions, mm -hmm. instead of the small talk like uh, object system. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of generic, uh, generic function is considered before, and uh, uh, actually, I don't know, 20, most 18 years ago, 17 years ago, the, the guy named the guy Deku implemented the, the generic function, the multiple dispatch in Ruby, and uh, it's based on the class. And, uh, and uh, he didn't disclose the, uh, 
he didn't disclose the implementation. He just uh, implemented by himself, and he just uh, report the result. And he reported it, it was failure. The, I, back then, I didn't understand what he said. But uh, thinking, yeah, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. And, uh, and uh, it's, I'm thinking right now, the, the generic function dispatch is based on class. So, which is totally against the duck typing. So, that, I think that is the, the reason Guy uh, this considered it was a failure. Well, from a user's perspective, it's different than having classes, right? Yeah, you have to, yeah, in multiple dispatch, you have to uh, specify class to, to dispatch. But uh, the dispatch based on class is against the duck typing. Okay. And what about the macro system? Uh, I recommended some kind of a transpiler. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a question, I guess, kind of to the panel. Um, Ruby comes with mutable strings by default, and a lot of the new languages out there are just giving up on this concept and going with non-mutable strings by default and you have to opt in. And is this something that could be considered um, removed from, let's say, Ruby, uh, for Ruby 3 in favor of performance? Or is this one of those cases where elegance is always going to win? Uh, the compatibility wins, unfortunately. But uh, we have some kind of optimization that says that uh, string.freeze does not uh, invoke the method and uh, freeze by in compile time, like uh, we 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 may add some kind of the, the prefix or suffix to say this this work, this uh, strings is uh, frozen okay immutable, and then that would, that things would come in the in the future, or maybe we have some kind of the magic variable so that all the literals in this file is immutable or something like that. So we are thinking about those kind of idea, but uh, you know, it always in the the explicit path of the the you know transition. Uh, otherwise, we cannot do, do any progress in the sake for the sake of uh, incompatibility. Any more questions from the floor? We have time for maybe one more question. Nope. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> We're all very nice. You don't see Matt and Aaron and, you know, Shibara-san and Aman in town every day. So... Okay, if not, then I'll ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll ask a question. So, as you can see, <laughs> a lot of, you know, us over here are pretty shy. And at the same time, Probably most of us are involved in building applications rather than going deep into Ruby itself. Um, how, for people who really want to get into Ruby, uh, into committing to Ruby and contributing to Ruby, what do you think uh, is the best thing for them to do? So, you know, the, 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 for the first step, so don't consider yourself uh, don't, don't ex exclude yourself from the, the core community. So you are part of the, our team. So in a broader, broader Ruby community, which is uh, the, the is the bridge to the core community. So the the problem you see is the framework problem for us, and the problem we see is problem for you guys. So the you. You can do many things. So use Ruby and uh, see the the. Uh, you can think about the, the how to improve the language or to find out the the the, comp the complaint about the okay this 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 is this is too slow or something like that and then then go submit the, your uh, proposal complaint to the the bug trackers and then. Then we start discussing about discuss about the uh, 
the issue. So in that sense, we can move on. We can improve the language. So we have we can have the fresh in aspect, uh, fresh insight from the community. So that that is the driving force of the core community, core, core developers. So so consider yourself uh, involved in the core developers. I would say if you run into things, so if you want to get involved, uh, what you should do is if you ever run into something you don't understand why it's working, or you just want to understand how something works, you should always be asking why it does that. So say, okay, why is this particular thing slow, or why is this, you know, why does it behave this way? And this probably won't sound very fun, but you should just keep researching it and don't give up until you understand exactly why it behaves that way. And once you do that, you're going to start finding yourself digging into, eventually digging deeper and deeper into the thing, trying to understand that particular thing that you're dealing with. And once you do that, maybe you'll discover why and then you'll fix it and send a patch. Or if you finally do understand why and there is a valid reason for it, you've gained some knowledge about the internals or the thing that you're trying to deal with. But the important thing is to be persistent about it, as Amon was saying earlier. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, you have something to add. Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, the contribution is not the only uh, core language code. So, we have our uh, Ruby language website and uh, API documentation. So, you can contribute to uh, translation or to uh, www.rubyrang. So example for uh, emoji guys, uh, Junior Fatas, uh, he reads to uh, translate uh, Chinese language from uh, English uh, on www.rubyrang. So uh, I think uh, East Asia have a lot of languages. So uh, Thailand and uh, Philippines and uh, well, and Japan, so uh, Chinese. So, but uh, WWE rang main language is uh, English. So, but uh, local language is not available on uh, our website. So please uh, contribute, uh, translate uh, these rang uh, these uh, please tra translate uh, your language from uh, English. So, we are welcome to uh, your contribute on our GitHub. Uh, www.rang.org is uh, available on GitHub. We accept via our pull requests. Uh, please. I'm <laughs> <laughs> anything to add? I was just going to echo what Aaron and... Uh, um, there's a lot of different ways to contribute, right? Like, you can contribute in terms of VM code, but there's also, like, we talked earlier about standard library. We're trying to clean up a lot of the code in there is legacy. It's very old. Going in there, helping split it out into gem, or even just improving it, rewriting it to match style. Guys writing more tests for it, uh, doing documentation, doing even the English documentation. A lot of it has typos or was written by non-native English speakers, and so there's parts where it's hard to parse and someone can easily go in and, you know, like a lot of times if you're reading documentation and you see something like that, make it a point to go in and open a pull request and just rewrite those two words in that one sentence because it really pays it forward the next time somebody is reading through that, it makes it that much easier for them to understand. Uh, but at the same time, if you are interested in getting into the deep VM level stuff, uh, Ruby is a great way of doing that. You know, I started as an application developer and I just had that itch, like Aaron said, I was like writing all this application code and I wanted to know what is it actually doing under the hood when I write this one line of Ruby that's so expressive, a lot of things are happening and there's n number of objects being created. How does objects actually exist? How does Ruby allocate them, get rid of them? And you can dive into the implementation and there's a lot of good resources in terms of uh, Ruby under the microscope uh, and other books like that, that really explain how the language is implemented. And even if you don't end up contributing at that level, just knowing how that works really can inform how you write Ruby code. Because if you understand that, you know, like if you're writing a line of Ruby and there's a string on there and you understand that under the hood, every time that uh, loop is being iterated over, there's a new object being created over it because you didn't call freeze at the end, you know, that really informs 
and makes it makes you that much more aware of when you're writing Ruby code, if whether or not it's going to be performant, because you actually understand what is it doing under the hood, how is it being executed, um, and that's a scratch, you know, a niche that I've scratched a lot, and I've written a lot of tools that I would encourage you to also check out. You know, Sam up there has some tools as well, a lot of profilers and debuggers and tracers, uh, and those really give you that level of insight where you have an application, you know, all of us have big applications, you can attach these debuggers and stuff to it and start to understand, okay, like when this request is being processed, what's happening? And that's really the best way to get in there. And a lot of times you'll find random bugs and things that can be made easily better, you know, like even a few months ago, I attached a very uh, simple C memory profiler and found that 20 megs of RAM was just being wasted because uh, every time you require a file, uh, we would expand the file name and we were allocating a four kilobyte buffer for the file name. Even if the file name was four bytes, there was a four kilobyte buffer and our app had thousands and thousands of requires added up to 20 megs, you know? All I did was attach a memory profiler and just saw that's what was happening. Uh, so at this point, I want to give a plug as well, um, because even though I, I said you know, the people here don't really contribute back to Ruby, actually in the last year, uh, we have seen a very promising project coming out from Singapore itself. It's called uh, Ruby Bench, um, which is working on uh, profiling uh, the various Ruby pull requests and making sure that you know, they don't uh, regress in terms of performance. So it's actually done by uh, Guo Xiang over there, and he's probably going to talk about it more uh, in his talk tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm pretty bullish. I hope we can see more people over here as well participating and contributing more to Ruby as well. Hmm. And next year, it could be you. Um, I think that uh, the folks here on stage have done so much hard work to make sure that we don't have to. So let's give them a big thanks.